All right, everybody, we are going to get started in just a second. Thank you so much for coming out. Are you excited? Yes, me too. I don't know if you've heard, but I really like apologetics. Uh, it's kind of kind of my thing. So I, I'm uh, I'm really excited tonight. Uh, it's kind of what it takes me back to teaching. I knew that I was having a, a sub or a guest speak uh, guest speaker, and I'd warn the kids like, "You better be good. You better be good tonight, all right? Because you represent us well." But luckily, you guys are already so awesome, and I know you're already going to be good. So. I do want to introduce uh, our speaker tonight. We are uh, really blessed to have Keaton Halley with us tonight. Uh, and although Keaton was converted to Christ as a young boy for years, he had unanswered questions about why evolution and the evidence he learned in science class was not consistent with the Bible stories he had heard in church. It wasn't until his senior year of high school that he first heard a creation speaker answer many of his basic questions explaining how the geological evidence, dinosaurs, and biological complexity were completely consistent with the Bible's historical account. After receiving a degree in visual communications from Judson University, Keaton also earned a master's degree in Christian apologetics from Biola University. Keaton now serves as the graphic artist for the U.S. office of CMI in Atlanta. Keaton's passion, to share, Keaton's passion to share this life-changing message with others is clearly evident as he directly answers the same challenges with which he has wrestled. So if you will join me in welcoming Keaton Halley. Well, good evening. It is wonderful to be with you, to be back in the Midwest. I actually grew up in Chicagoland, moved to Atlanta about nine years ago when I started working for Creation Ministries International. And we are an apologetics ministry. Uh, that word was already used, and I have a degree in that. But if, if that term is new to you, the word apologetics does not mean running around saying you're sorry all the time, right? Uh, no, that's what husbands do, I'm told. <laughs> Uh, rather, the word apologetics just means giving a logical reasoned defense for your beliefs, and in this case, the truth of Christianity. So that's what our ministry is all about, trying to show that the Bible is God's word, it's reliable and trustworthy. And in particular, we focus on the book of Genesis, which is one of the most attacked areas of Scripture. And so tonight, we're going to talk about um, the subject of Genesis and science and how these things relate um, is it true that we have to shut off our brains to, to believe the Bible? Well, not at all. Real science helps to support the truth claims that we find in the book of Genesis and the rest of Scripture as well. And so I just want to encourage you folks to be informed in this area. Uh, because it is one of the most attacked areas, then um, we, if we want to protect our families against an onslaught of teaching about evolution that tries to undermine faith in, in Scripture— um, then we need to be informed. And if we want to be effective in sharing the gospel message with non-believers, uh, the same is true, that we need to be informed in this area because so often this subject comes up in evangelistic encounters. But to sort of help you understand why Genesis is so important to the rest of the Bible and why it's one of the most attacked areas today, uh, I thought I'd share a bit more about my own story. Um, it was mentioned that I, I grew up in the church. I ha had a Christian home. My mom led me to Jesus when I was just seven years old. So I really don't remember a time of ever not being a Christian. Um, I didn't have any major periods of, you know, stumbling or rebellion or anything like that. But as a young person, I did have many questions because I also had many non-Christian influences in those early years. Uh, for example, I went to public school where they taught me about evolution. And I had non-Christian friends and I even watched television, if you can believe that. <laughs> and those things led me to wrestle a bit with my faith. And so as a young person, I had questions along these lines. How do I know that God is real? Do I only believe that because that's the way I was raised? That's what my parents and my church taught me? Or are there good reasons to believe that a creator God exists? Uh, I wondered about those bones that scientists discover. They get announced in the news every so often, right? That supposedly show that humans descended from ape-like ancestors. If we don't believe that as Christians, if we believe Genesis, then what do we do with those fossils? Or I wondered about if creation took place in six ordinary days, then when did the dinosaurs exist? Um, they don't seem to be mentioned in Scripture. And so how do you reconcile these two perspectives? Dinosaurs living millions of years ago, creation in six days, and so on. Or here's another big question that I had. 
if the creator is a God of love, why did he make a world that's so filled with tragedy and death and suffering that we see all around us? How can you reconcile this, the horrors we see in the world with the, the God of love that the, God, that, uh, that the Bible portrays? Now, I was thankful as I grew older. When I got to high school, I did have these questions answered to my satisfaction. I, I was, uh, it was a creation speaker that came to my area and helped me to see that the Bible is trustworthy. Uh, but I want you to think about this on a personal level this evening. If you had to take a pop quiz and answer all four of those questions right now, <laughs> how well would you do? Does that make you a little fearful? Uh, what if a friend comes you know, along and asks you one of these questions? Do you feel like, boy, I wouldn't know what to say? What if moms and dads, your children or grandchildren, ask you about these questions? Um, Well, I think it's important to have answers in these areas because oftentimes people, non-Christians, ask these same questions, right? And oftentimes they think that there are no answers available. And yet what I discovered is, no, there there are great answers. Imagine, though, had I never been given those answers. Sadly, a lot of people grow up in church and they ask questions like these and they're told, oh, don't worry about that, just trust, just have a blind sort of faith. Well, the Bible certainly requires us to have faith as Christians, but it's always faith placed in where the, where the evidence points, right? There's always, um, it's a trustworthy God that we serve. That's why he's worthy of our trust. Um, but we know from different research groups like George Barna and others that do surveys, they've estimated that about two out of every three teens that grows up in the church ends up walking away from that faith that uh, their parents and their church raised them in. And sadly, these statistics even seem to be on the increase. Now, it's not just Barna research, but other groups have, have come up with similar figures. Um, regardless of the exact, you know, what, what figure is the exactly correct one, that, that's a significant amount of our young people that are walking away. And what's the reason for that? Well, I think oftentimes when you ask these people, you know, why is it that you left church? They'll say things like, well, I asked those tough questions and I never got answers, or I now believe that science uh, gives me the truth, and I think the Bible's just outdated fairy tales, right? And so many people in our culture think that science shows evolution to be fact, and therefore you can't trust what we read in the book of Genesis. And yet the Bible tells us that we should be ready to give answers for for challenges like this. In 1 Peter 3.15, it says that we should, in our hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense. Or some translations say, be ready to give an answer. And who do we do that to? Well, basically anyone that says to you, why are you a Christian? Um, You know, anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And that last part is important. Let's not be obnoxious as we're dialoguing with uh, non-believers and give them more reasons to reject the faith. But um, I also like Peter's emphasis here on preparation. Notice it says, be prepared to make a defense. And so when I think of this verse, it often reminds me of the Marine Corps motto that says, the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in battle. And so training, preparation is important. And, and think about it. When you take a, a test in school, if you've just crammed for the final the night before or not studied at all, then taking the test might be a little intimidating. <laughs> but if you've spent many hours preparing for that test, then you can just breeze through it. You can, you can be excited to take it and know that you're going to do a good job, right? And I think the same thing is true of us when we witness to others. If we've thought through the reasons why we say we're a Christian, then we can be excited when somebody says to us, hey, why do you believe the Bible? You say that's the word of God. How, how do you know that's true? Do you have any evidence or reasons behind your convictions at all? And so we at Creation Ministries want to come alongside you and equip you with those sorts of reasons and answers. We've developed many tools that'll help to strengthen your faith and help you to share it with others. Now, one of those would be our website. Now, the address is kind of a long, complicated one, so you might want to get a pen and paper out to write this down. It's creation.com. Yeah. All right, not so bad. That's easy to memorize, isn't it? And so I hope you will take advantage of this website in the future, bookmark it on your smartphones or what have you. Um, Students especially, if you encounter evolution in the classroom, look for answers on this site. And 99 times out of 100, there will already be an answer available to you. But you can submit your questions as well. We have 40-plus years of creation research available at your fingertips. 
and we're answering the questions like dinosaurs and ape men and uh, carbon dating and plate tectonics and uh, fossils and how did Noah get all the animals aboard the ark or how did we get all the different people groups in the world if we all go back to Adam and Eve just a few thousand years ago? Why did God create poisonous spiders and so on? Um, and also, we'll make it even easier on you. You don't have to remember to go to the website if you just want to sign up for our email newsletter. That'll send you some of the most recent popular articles uh, on a basically weekly basis. So this is a free tool. If you'd like to sign up for that email newsletter tonight, uh, in just a moment, these sheets are going to be circulated around. You can just put down your name and your email address and also your zip code if you want to find out more about events coming back to this area in the future. All right? So um, go ahead, my volunteers. You guys can pass those around at this time. And while those are circulating, um, we don't quite have enough boards to go to you know, every single row, but you, you guys can just help them to get circulated among uh, everyone so everybody gets a chance to sign up, if you, if you would, please. Now, um, I want to focus on this verse from John chapter 3 as a kind of a springboard for my message this evening. Uh, because I think this is very relevant, what Jesus said here, to the culture that we live in today. Now, most Christians are, are pretty familiar with John chapter 3. That's where Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus about his need to be born again. In other words, he's sharing the gospel message in this context. And, and we all know John 3.16, right? Even many non-Christians know that verse, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that we could have eternal life, ultimately. But right before verse 16, here in verse 12, Jesus says something interesting. He says, if I've told you earthly things and you don't believe those, how can you believe me when I tell you of heavenly things? And I want to apply that, that statement in a particular way this evening, because we tend to look at the Bible, I think, as, as the church today, by and large, and, and think of it as a spiritual book, which it certainly is. But the Bible's not only a spiritual book. It also talks about subjects more in our everyday experience, things like history, right? And I think the sort of thing that Jesus is saying here, if, if the Bible made mistakes in subjects like history, geography, math, science, would it make any sense to treat it as the Word of God, to trust it for its message about how to be saved, how to go to heaven? Well, not at all. If, if the Bible contained blunders, God doesn't make mistakes, so it couldn't be his Word, right? And yet the Bible talks about history a lot, real people like uh, Noah and Abraham, real events like the exodus from Egypt, real places like Jerusalem. And so it's important to trust the Bible when it, when it comes to these earthly things, not just the heavenly things. And so in thinking about that, it's also important how we train our young people, I believe, in our, in our churches today, because so often we're, we're teaching them the spiritual truths, but let's not forget to, to help them see that the Bible's earthly things are correct as well. Because young people often that grow up in the church, they'll still attend public schools, maybe go to some secular university where they might have a professor that says, welcome to science class this year. I just want to warn you religious students ahead of time that my goal is not to undermine anybody's faith in this class, and yet you might experience some discomfort, you know, because we're going to look at the scientific facts this year. We're going to study things like biology. And if you come from a religious background that says that a god made everything in the beginning supernaturally, created all the animals with distinct kinds and so forth, kinds of animals and plants. If that view gives you meaning and purpose in life, you're welcome to hold to those views in my class. But in my classroom, we're also going to look at the facts of fossils and DNA that show that actually living things are all related in a tree of life. One kind of living thing can be radically transformed over millions of years into a very different type of living thing. What do we call that idea? Evolution, right? In this class, we're also going to look at the study of human beings, anthropology. Now, you may have been taught that the first man was made from the dust of the ground, the first woman from his rib. If that view gives you meaning and purpose in life, you're welcome to hold to those convictions. But in my class, we're going to look at the fossil and DNA evidence that shows that humans as a group descended from a population of ape-like ancestors. And we're going to look at geology as well. You may have been taught that there was a worldwide flood in the time of Noah. If that view is yours, you're welcome to hold to that. But we're also going to look at facts in this class like those rock layers and fossils that show the world is millions of years old, that these layers were laid down slowly and gradually. And so really, there's no room in that rock record, no evidence of a global flood. And so what's happening in students' perception as they're being taught so-called truths about science 
They think they're getting the facts at school. The professor might not even actually explicitly mention the biblical account, right? But if he just teaches this alternative history of the world, it contradicts the Bible's history. And students are smart enough to see that, right? And so they end up thinking, science, my school has the truth. It contradicts what I'm learning at church. Maybe the Bible is just fairy tales. It's contrary to science. So you see the problem. In fact, we at Creation Ministries went and interviewed some young people on, on college campuses a few years back in the Bible Belt, and we just asked these students four different questions, secular universities. We asked them, number one, were you raised in the church? And if they said no, then we kind of moved on. We just wanted to focus on those young people that, by their own testimony, had some sort of Christian upbringing. And so um, then we asked them, what do you believe today, creation or evolution? And guess what? Out of the young people who were raised in the church, nearly all of them said they now believed in evolution or some sort of compromise between the two. Third, we asked them, do you still attend church today? And guess what? Those who said they now believed in evolution were no longer attending church, maybe just on Christmas and Easter, except for one young man still attended faithfully. Uh, But then we asked last, the fourth question was, when you were a young person growing up, were you ever exposed to any evidence for Christianity? Did your family or your church present things like a a case, a scientific case maybe for creation or anything along those lines? And tragically, all of these young people said, no, I was never taught those things. Now, the handful of people that we found who were still attending church, guess what? They, They did believe in creation and they had been trained as young people with a defense for their faith. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that there's any kind of you know, just magical formula that we can use, you know, just say the right words, and it's going to guarantee that our kids uh, remain in in the faith. But um, I do think that pattern that we observed was, is significant. And it suggests to me that we can have a significant impact on young people by training them up in the right way. Do you realize we actually live in sort of a golden age of apologetics, where we have more answers available in this generation than any previous one? And so the, the answers are out there if we simply take the time to look. And we should help others. When, you know, even if you've been to church all your life, you have gray hair today, you think, oh, yes, I already affirm Genesis creation. Why do I need to hear about this? Well, it's so that you can help others to know that same truth. Let's pass on that information to future generations. Uh, so many of our resources that we publish focus on Genesis because it is so foundational, as I mentioned, to the rest of our Christian faith. If you think about it, Genesis is like a foundation for much of the Bible's theology. In fact, it's rooted in the earthly things, that history in Genesis 1 to 11. Uh, And and how is that? Well, uh, let me illustrate this point by quoting from an up-and-coming young theologian who understands the importance of Genesis, Uh, but she is only seven years old. So I'll let her mother tell you her story, all right? Uh, There was a Christian mom who wrote this letter. She said, My seven-year-old daughter, Jessica, is a deep thinker when it comes to theological questions. And recently, we discussed why bad things happen sometimes. We reread the story of Adam and Eve and how sin came into the world. Now, later that week, Jessica was ill and had to stay home from school. Feeling miserable, she told me, If only Adam and Eve hadn't eaten the fruit, I wouldn't be sick. But before I could answer, she said, Of course, if they didn't eat it, we'd be sitting here naked. (laughs) Well, I like the way seven-year-olds think. And you could say that Jessica has a pretty robust Christian worldview for that that age, right? Uh, Because she knows what happened in Eden didn't stay in Eden. That's because Adam was a real man in history, and his actions impact our lives right down to the present. Right? You could say Jessica thought of Genesis like a foundation for for a variety of teachings, right? Uh, Think about the whole idea of why we wear clothes in the first place. I don't know if you thought about that before. I notice everyone here tonight has clothing on. I think that's wonderful. (laughs) But there's a good moral reason for that, right? It's not merely to stay warm when the weather gets chilly. And do you realize it goes back to Genesis 1 to 11? When God, uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, they disobeyed their maker, then God killed an animal. Apparently, he clothed them with coats of skins, Genesis tells us. Uh, What what about an even more important subject like marriage? The Bible talks a lot about marriage and God's intentions for what uh, marriage ought to be, and this is, of course, under attack in our culture, right? We have um, same-sex marriage, you know, now 
legalized, although I don't think the Supreme Court's supposed to be the, the lawmaking body, but in any case, um, we have this challenge, how to understand what marriage is even to be. And that relates to Genesis as well, because when Jesus was challenged on the subject of divorce, you remember the, the Pharisees at one point came to trap him, and they said, Jesus, can a man divorce his wife for any reason? Do you remember how he responded? He said, well, first, what does the law tell you? Because the Pharisees were experts in the law, right? Meaning the Mosaic law, the Old Testament. And the Pharisees said, well, Moses allowed divorce. And Jesus said, that's true, but God only permitted it because of, do you know, the hardness of your hearts, right? And so what was he saying there? That that was not God's ideal from the beginning. Yeah, in a fallen world, sometimes it's necessary, but that's not the way things are supposed to be. And that's not all he said on the matter. Then he, he went on to say, have you not read, which if you think about it, that's quite an insult to these experts in the Bible, right? Don't you read your Bibles? <laughs> is what he's saying in effect. Haven't you read, and he quotes then from Genesis 1 and 2, that he who made them from the beginning of creation made them male and female. So he's saying, if you want to understand what marriage is to be, then you have to go back to when marriage originated. God instituted it with Adam and Eve when he created them. Eve historically being one of flesh coming from Adam's side, right? And so Jesus said, don't separate, therefore, what God has joined together. Um, so marriage is tied to Genesis. What about this concept that we're born with a sin nature? And this idea that, do you realize the death rate today is 100%? <laughs> Does that bother anyone besides me? <laughs> well, God told Adam and Eve, don't eat from this tree over here, and if you do, you will surely, what? Die. And so we inherit that, that um, the sin nature from our forefather Adam and the penalty as well than we're due because we're sinners ourselves, and so um, everybody today um, ends up in the grave. And so do you realize how, therefore, even the gospel message is tied to Genesis? Why do we even need a Savior in the first place? It's to fix the problem that began with the first two people back in the garden. And so Jessica understands this, this currently, right? She knows that, yeah, Genesis is, is foundational to the rest of Scripture, but what happens as she gets older and her faith is attacked and the world tells her, don't you know, science proves evolution, science proves millions of years, Genesis can't be taken as real straightforward history. Um, once Genesis is undermined in her thinking, is it any wonder that in the culture that no longer believes Genesis, that it's harder and harder to get people to accept the Bible's teachings about morality? about those heavenly things, about the gospel message itself. It doesn't make sense without that foundation. And so I submit if we want to be effective as a church in reaching a lost world for Christ and uh, winning people to the Lord, and if we want to be effective in winning these culture war battles over these moral issues, clashes over things like abortion, same-sex marriage, and so on, then we have to restore people's confidence in the book of Genesis, to see that the whole of Scripture is the Word of God. Now, at the same time, I understand how this can be controversial even within the church, right? Because a lot of Christians will say, well, sure, I, I affirm that God is creator. That's really important and, and basic truths of Genesis. But is it really so important to believe that God created in six literal 24-hour days? Does that matter so much? Maybe we shouldn't make a fuss about that. Or this idea that Noah's flood covered the whole planet, you know, that's what our ministry affirms, and, and a lot of people say, well, oh, that doesn't, that's kind of a side issue, right? Like, why, it, maybe it could just be a local flood in the Middle East. Well, uh, we think that the language of Genesis itself is part of why we take those things as real, reliable history, because um, the immediate context affir would affirm those things, I'd argue. But let me even give you some other additional reasons, some, some theological things from the New Testament that help to confirm a straightforward understanding of Genesis. Uh, for example, um, the verse that I quoted for just a few um, minutes ago about from Jesus' lips where he explains marriage to the Pharisees by bringing them back to Genesis, uh, is, it occurs here in Mark chapter 10. Jesus says, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. But I also want you to notice now, according to Jesus, when did God make the first human beings? after millions and billions of years had already taken place in Earth's history? No, Jesus said Adam and Eve were around from the beginning of creation. And think about what that entails. Um, 
Jesus was affirming something like this biblical timeline that I've got on the top here, where um, if you just take Genesis as at face value, then God made everything in six days, and then we have genealogies in Scripture from the time of Adam. Adam had Seth when he was 130. Seth, he had Enos at 105, I think it was. And you add up those numbers, and then creation took place just a few thousand years ago from those genealogies. Now, Jesus seems to be affirming that view, right? Because he says people were around from the beginning of creation. If they're made on day six of creation week, you put that on timeline of thousands of years, first humans are there at the beginning of the timeline. But contrast that view with the evolutionary perspective, or the the view that says the world is millions of years old. When did human beings arrive according to that story? They weren't here at the time of the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, right? Not when the earth first formed four and a half billion years ago, not when the first life appeared three billion years ago, not until the last million years or so ago. Uh, depending, depending on how exactly you define a human being in their view, you know, according to the fossil record, but um, certainly not at the beginning of creation, as Jesus said. And so really this, this concept of the world being that ancient contradicts the view of Jesus. Now, here's another problem with the whole concept of millions of years. It primarily comes from an interpretation of the rock record. Right? Like you look at the walls of Grand Canyon and the Earth's crust, and you can see layer upon layer of sedimentary rock. How did those get deposited? Was it slowly and gradually, some of these layers being millions of years old, the lower, lower ones and so forth? Well, if those rock, and that's the, that is the conventional view, right? That the rock layers in the canyon are millions of years old. Well, if so, then everything we find inside those rocks must also be that ancient. And you know what we find inside the rock layers? We find billions and billions of dead things. <laughs> that's what fossils are, right, by and large. So if millions of years were the correct view of Earth's history, that would mean that death has been around in this world for millions of years. But what does the Bible teach us about how death first entered the world? Well, the early chapters of Genesis speak about the Garden of Eden, and here we've got a rare photograph of Eden. (laughs) Uh, Somebody snapped this on day six of creation week, I've been told. And think about at that stage of history, after God has finished making the whole universe— The sun, moon, and stars are there, the plants, the animals, the first two people. And at the end of the sixth day, God looked on everything that he had made and said, Behold, it is very good, Genesis 1.31. So when God is calling the world very good prior to Adam's sin, doesn't he mean it's free from the curse that he would later put on creation? It's, It's not full of pain and death and disease and suffering and animals eating one another and thorns and thistles, right? But those are the things that we find in the fossil record, right? So if we try to marry millions of years with the Bible, as as many well-meaning Christians do, you know, you can be a Christian and hold to that view, but I'm just trying to gently step on, step on your toes, if that's your view, (laughs) if you tonight. Um, So, so think about what that would mean. It it would put the fossil record underneath the, the uppermost layers of Eden, right? Is this the picture that Genesis describes, that God called the world very good, but it was already filled with death and disease that had been going on for millions of years. And we do find diseases in things like dinosaur bones. Uh, Some dinosaurs, we can tell, had cancer, arthritis. Is this part of the world that God called very good? Uh, Not at all. Cancer is an enemy, isn't it? Uh, Death, the Bible says, is the last enemy to be destroyed. And so, you know, some Christians might have the idea that Adam's sin only affected other human beings. Uh, But remember, God put Adam and Eve in charge over nature, he gave them dominion, right, according to Genesis chapter 1. And so when <clears throat> Adam and Eve fell, just like when a king makes a bad decision, it can impact the rest of his kingdom. Well, that's when God cursed the ground for Adam's sake and said, now it's going to bring forth thorns and thistles and so forth. Um, and now the work is going to be toilsome and you're going to sweat, you know, the sweat of your brow and so on. Uh, take a look at the New Testament as well. reaffirms this view of Genesis that <clears throat> it started out good, and then there's something wrong with the world today because of sin. It says in Romans 8.22 that the whole creation is groaning. And the rest of this chapter talks about how the creation longs to be redeemed. Right? Why does it need to be redeemed? Because we're living in a fallen world that's been affected by Adam's sin. So to summarize, kind of the, the biblical teaching is that man came first and brought death into the world. But do you realize if evolution is true, then death came first and brought man into the world. 
And even for those Christians who say, well, yeah, I don't believe in evolution, but I do affirm the millions of years that you still have the death prior to mankind's existence. So that, that's a major challenge to that perspective. And, and think about how practical then this is. You know, I, hopefully you can see it's not just this debate over the age of the earth. I don't think it's merely theological hair splitting. Um, because, do you remember the, the four questions I asked at the very beginning? Number four was, why would a loving God make a world that's so filled with death and suffering? Right? And that can be very practical. You might wonder that yourself when a loved one passes away, um, maybe before their time and so forth. Why would God allow this? Um, well, do you see how if you believe in Genesis, if you take it at face value, then you can say, God didn't make a world that's broken already. He made it good, and it was sin that brought death into the world. Uh, but that, that answer really isn't the same if death has always been a part of creation as long as it's been around. And, and so the gospel is really tied together uh, with Genesis here as well, just as um, the Apostle Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at the way he compares Adam with Christ. He says, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And so which of these two men can we dispense with and still have the gospel make sense? Jesus had to be a real historical figure, but so did the first man, Adam, who brought sin into the world, who created the problem that Jesus came to solve. I like the way that someone once put it, that you can't understand the good news of the New Testament until you understand the bad news in Genesis. And so the, the bad news is a part of what our ministry defends. We're, a lot of people think, well, your name is Creation Ministries International, so you're probably going to talk just about the amazing design in nature and how it points to a designer. That certainly is a, a big part of what we do. But we don't just want to point to any vague, intelligent designer. We want to say that God's word is true. He's revealed himself there as well. And so we can believe in the authority of Genesis, where it describes not only creation, but also the fall and the flood and the Tower of Babel and everything from that point moving forward. And so where does that leave us as Christians? If, if you're in agreement with me that, yes, Genesis is, is, um, gives us reliable history, that it's not compatible with millions of years and evolution, doesn't that set us against the, the science? How are we to understand science then? Do we have to just ignore it, dismiss it, um, deny it? Shut off our brains, maybe, <laughs> to be a Christian. Well, no, not at all. I, I'm not up here this evening to attack science. I think when science is rightly understood, it strongly supports the truth claims of the Bible. But the key, the key is really to, to understand it rightly. And, and there are some challenges here. Of course, the, the media likes to portray this controversy as though Christians deny, deny science. But that's not, that, that's a caricature of our position, Right? One of the challenges we face here is that the word science itself can mean more than one thing. Most of the time when, when somebody hears the word science, they're going to think of operational science, which is the type of science that deals with the present, where you can make observations, you can do experiments, and repeat them again and again to check your results against the real world, to see if your hypotheses are correct. And, and this kind of science is very powerful. It, it, carries a lot of um, authority in our culture. When, you know, when a news report says scientists say such and such, right? It, it doesn't seem to carry the same weight as if, like, uh, the same report says pastors say or something like that, which is maybe that, that's a tragedy in my mind. And yet, there is some good reason why science, operational science, carries a lot of authority. And that's because it's been tremendously successful in giving us uh, modern technology and modern medicinal cures and things like that, right? Smartphones, sending a man to the moon, those are accomplishments um, that are due to operational science. But actually, do you realize this kind of science is dependent on a biblical worldview? Many historians of science recognize that Christianity provided the fertile soil out of which the modern scientific revolution grew. And how is that? Well, because in order to do science in the first place, you have to have some faith commitments, like you should expect the world to be orderly. Well, other worldviews like atheism or polytheism or pantheism, why would you expect if those worldviews are correct that the world should be orderly? It only makes sense if it was created by a god of order. Not, you know, Zeus and his gang, if they were in charge of the universe, the, the world would be chaos, right? Or if, or if there's no god who made this place, why would you expect 
order in nature. And the first scientists looked for order in nature because uh, they were flourishing in this society largely influenced by a biblical way of thinking. Not all were Bible-believing Christians, but many, many were, many founders of modern scientific disciplines. Uh, b- but that's why, because of this authority that operational science has, that evolutionists want to say, well, our, our theory is part of that as well. You should, you should believe us when we talk about millions of years, when we talk about um, dinosaurs evolving into birds or humans descending from apes, things like that. And yet, when we're talking about the past, that's not nearly as authoritative, the, the claims of science in this case. You can still use a type of science to investigate the past, but it's not nearly as powerful and the bias that you bring with you will govern how you interpret the evidence in this case, right? And so we should take the the claims about the past with a grain of salt. For example, when we talk about fossils, let's just do a case study here. Um, Most of the public has the impression that fossils equate to millions of years or evolution, right? And even those of us in the church, I'm sure we've, we've been influenced by these ideas. Think about even the way our language gives us away when we call another person a fossil, what are we saying about them? <laughs> see, see what, we've been trained to think like that, right, in, in these evolutionary ways. Fossils equal old. But do fossils really form slowly and gradually, or can we prove that they um, were buried millions of years ago? Uh, not at all. We can do a thought experiment together. If you have a goldfish bowl at home, when your goldfish die, typically, do they sink to the bottom, lie there for decades or centuries, waiting to get slowly covered by layer upon layer of sediment? No, typically they're going to float to the top, right? At least for a little while. And more importantly, that they'll decay from bacteria and they'll be picked apart by scavengers. They're going to disappear after a few weeks in most cases. It's rare, it's, it's a, an oddity to get a fossil forming. It requires special circumstances. Right? I mean, how would you form a goldfish fossil if you actually wanted to? You could sneak up behind him when he's not looking with a cement truck and unload a pile of concrete on top of his head. And if you bury him deeply enough, he'll be protected from those even burrowing organisms that want to get in there and tear him apart. And with the right chemistry in the water, you can turn his bones to stone in a hurry. So it really doesn't take eons and eons, it requires a catastrophe, something to bury the organism quickly, separate it from the environment that wants to cause it to disintegrate. But we don't just have to argue from goofy cartoons. Let me show you some real-life examples of fossils that formed quite rapidly. Uh, Here's one we had on our website a while back. This um, group of fish, obviously entombed in stone, turned into a fossil, but they're all pointing the same direction, approximately, right? If these had died one at a time and sunk to the ocean floor, they'd be pointing every which direction, based on the current at the time. Uh, that's not the case. Clearly, this was a group of fish at school, before the bell rang, got buried by sediment, <laughs> frozen, and couldn't even uh, wiggle out of that position. Uh, lots of examples along these lines. Here's an ichthyosaur. This is a, an extinct creature. This is just a computer-generated image of it. But this is a reptile that once lived in our ocean waters. And we know them from the fossil record. Like this picture here is a fossil that we know was buried very suddenly. And that's because where the arrow is pointing, that is a baby ichthyosaur almost fully out of the birth canal. In other words, these give birth to live young underwater. Um, The baby's born backwards, you know, tail first. But this, obviously, these two reptiles were in the process of giving birth, being born, and then a flood of sediment must have buried them so suddenly they couldn't even finish the process. And it doesn't take millions of years to give birth, right? In fact, praise the Lord for that, right, ladies? (laughs) But it's not just the burial that happens quickly. What about turning to stone? Well, even the chemistry is is not hard to understand. And um, we, we could show you lots of examples of human artifacts that have been turned to stone, like this fossil hat from New Zealand got buried by volcanic ash. Only 20 years afterwards, someone dug it out and it had evolved from a soft hat into a hard hat. <laughs> Once made of felt, I guess evolution does happen in some cases. Or, or here's another example, my favorite, uh, rock-hard teddy bears that are made at a gift shop in England. And these are soft teddy bears initially. They hang them on a string underneath this mineral-rich well water that drips down onto them. They soak up the water, evaporates away, and leaves behind just the hard minerals. And so how many centuries, <laughs> decades does it take to to cover a bear in flowstone, just three to five months is all it takes. 
And so, uh, really, many informed evolutionists would be aware of this, that yes, fossils do indeed form quite quickly. In, in all of our experience, nobody's been around to observe them uh, form slowly over millions of years. And even just logically, it seems to make sense that it would have to be a, a quick uh, burial. But they might point to other evidence that fossils supposedly prove evolution. You know, they might say, well, hang on, Mr. Creationist, you guys keep talking about the missing links. Don't you know that we've found many of these intermediate creatures? Uh, well, here's an example that they trumpeted on the cover of Science back in 1983. Uh, they named this creature Pachycetus, which means the whale from Pakistan, where he was found. Now, you have to understand, evolutionists believe that whales, because they are mammals, they're more closely related to other mammals, like creatures that have four legs and walk around on the land, than they would be to schools of fish. So they said, if evolution is true, we should expect to find in the fossil record some creatures that are um, partway between land creature and whale, as over millions of years, they became more and more adapted to living in the ocean. Now, here's an example. Well, are you convinced by Pachycetus? He, he looks intermediate, doesn't he? He's got four legs, but they're rather paddle-like. Um, he's got a very streamlined body for diving into the ocean and swimming through the water. Um, lots of blubber there, apparently, too, for keeping him warm at the depths. But, of course, what we're looking at here is a drawing of Pachycetus, right? And what we should learn to say, especially young people here, um, learn to think critically and ask challenging questions of these evolutionary claims. You know, you could say, that's a nice drawing. What's the evidence that you have to draw Pachycetus in that way? Well, at the time they made this painting, inside the magazine it tells you they found no bones below the neck, just the, not even the full skull, just the shaded bits that you see here. Now, the reason they think Pachycetus is related to whales is because, even though it was much smaller, like three to four feet it would have been in length, uh, but they found that the ear bone of Pachycetus supposedly re resembles modern whale ear bones. Now, it turns out since then, it's, first of all, it's not as similar as is often claimed, but we've also found other creatures that had that lived on the land and had ear bones like this. But not only that, this doesn't always happen, but often it does. Years later, they found much more of the skeleton of Pachycetus. Not just the bones from the head, but they found the animal head hooves. And here's the way they reconstruct Pachycetus today. You see how that's quite a different picture from their original evolutionary guesswork. And so again, the bias that we bring to the table is going to govern how we interpret the evidence. I believe this is just an extinct rodent, nothing to do with the origin of whales. Not a hint of blubber or a blowhole anywhere on this creature. Uh, we could look at other examples, though, of these so-called missing links. What about with human beings? Did we descend from ape-like ancestors? Uh, that's what they always tell us. Uh, Neanderthals, I'm sure you've heard of before. Uh, back in 1909, they were depicting Neanderthals as very brutish. This fellow looks kind of like King Kong, right? <laughs> Covered in fur, stooped over, bent kneed. Um, and yet, do you realize, this is a case where we're not just finding a few scraps and bits of bones. Uh, there are something like over 500 Neanderthal graves that have been found in Europe and the Middle East. And the more evolutionists have learned about Neanderthals, the more that they've realized that they are very much like you and me, right? In fact, here's the way they reconstruct them in their modern sculptures, in museum displays and so forth. Uh, again, that's quite a different picture, isn't it? And do you realize how well they trimmed their hair and combed it and cleaned the dirt off their faces? That's not part of the fossil evidence. <laughs> that's artistic license that goes into these reconstructions. But if you gave these folks a shave and a shower, would they even stand out in a crowd? You know, dress them up in modern clothes? They look like they could be your relatives, right? And guess what? Don't laugh too hard, because Neanderthals are our relatives from a biblical perspective. We know that from their anatomy. They have human anatomy, stood up right on two legs, opposable thumbs, the whole deal. Um, we, they had culture um, that shows that they were intelligent, not dim-witted brutes. Um, they had, for example, they cooked their meat over a fire. They often had shelters. They had clothing, almost certainly. They had um, sometimes sophisticated tools that are composite, like wooden shaft with a stone tip that they attached with a high-tech superglue that they manufactured from the fires that they um, created and so forth. And so, um, and, and finally, the DNA. We're now extracting DNA from these Neanderthal bones, and that we've investigated. It turns out nearly everyone in the world today has Neanderthal DNA in them, meaning that many uh, among our ancestors would be these Neanderthals and related groups like Denisovans and so forth. 
Um, one, one sort of humorous way the humanity of Neanderthals was illustrated is when the guy on the upper right, the BBC sculpture you see there, when that was first released to the public, one news headline said, BBC's Neanderthal man looks a lot like, can you tell me? Chuck Norris. And there you can compare the two to see the uncanny resemblance. <laughs> Uh, I'm, of course, mean no disrespect to Chuck Norris. Um, he's a wonderful Christian man, I understand, but uh, rather it's to the credit of Neanderthals that they looked so much like you and me. So we've looked at fossils for a little bit as kind of just a case study here and seen that fossils can form quickly. They don't need millions of years. Number two, the claims about missing links are often open to different interpretations when more evidence comes in. And third, we've seen that as Christians, we don't want to say those fossil bones are millions of years old. That would put death prior to Adam's sin, right? And so how are we to understand the fossil record as a whole then? If this is not a record of slow and gradual processes over millions of years, can you think of anything that occurred after Adam and Eve's time that might account for this, you know, catastrophic deposit of billions of dead creatures buried all over the world, <laughs> all of our continents, and placed by, apparently, moving water. Something involving a lot of water. How about a worldwide flood in Noah's time? And once you realize the vast majority of the fossil record was deposited by Noah's flood, that means there is powerful testimony from the scientific evidence that points to the truth of Genesis, not away from it. Now, some people have the idea that wouldn't a catastrophe like a flood just mix everything up in a big soupy mess? How could the flood deposit these layers of sedimentary rock? But actually, we've seen that catastrophes can do just that. Um, Mount St. Helens is a good example, not a flood, but a volcanic eruption that occurred on May 18, 1980. And that initial eruption lasted nine hours. A lot of the ash and pumice that went up into the sky came down and hardened into a layer of rock. And you can see the persons here for scale. That's quite a bit of rock from one eruption, right? But that's not the end of the story because less than a month later, that same volcano went off again, depositing these layers. Not one year after year after year, but the whole stack of light then dark, light then dark, was laid down in about three hours on June 12th, 1980. And then uh, less than two years after that, there was another eruption that melted some snow and ice that had built up at the summit of the volcano, caused a mud flow that came down the mountain did tremendous damage to the surrounding landscape and so forth, deposited this material as well. And so if one rather small volcano, by historical standards, Mount St. Helens was not actually that big, um, if one rather small volcano can do that much geological work in a short amount of time, just imagine what the worldwide flood would do in the year that Noah was aboard the ark. The flood was a catastrophic event. The Bible says the fountains of the great deep burst open at the onset of the flood. And think about a, a flood worldwide, what that would do to the landscape here in Indiana, right? It's gonna <laughs> mess things up and deposit lots of sediment and cause plate tectonics and, and so forth. Uh, of course, our ministry also deals with not just geology, but what, what about changes in living things? Doesn't that prove evolution? But of course, it's important to distinguish that evolutionists often treat it as though creationists deny any and all changes. We, we do believe in that biological changes are possible, we just think that they have limits. And so it's important to ask, is the type of change we're observing really good proof for evolution? Some professor might say that he can see evolution happening in his lab, but what he typically means is what he's observing are changes within a kind, variations on a theme, you know, within a type of butterfly, for example, right? Might have slight differences in the offspring and so forth. But what the student is hearing is that microbes can turn into mankind over millions of years. Uh, and that is not the same idea at all. Um, just because changes occur doesn't mean that the changes are endless possibilities, right? That any change is possible. And so uh, we point to things like, you know, sometimes people also have the idea that um, creationists believe that new species cannot arise. Actually, we do think new species can arise because a species is not the term the Bible uses. It's a, it's a man-made idea that just talks about whether two groups can interbreed together. But you might have one group branch into two different groups that can no longer interbreed. That would make two distinct species, and yet they could still be related back to the original kinds. Uh, take the cats, for example. Lions, tigers, leopards, classified as different species, but 
Did that mean that God had to create them as separate, distinct kinds in the beginning, and lions have always been lions? No, these are actually descended from um, some other cats, uh, and in fact, probably all the cats in the world, including even your house cats, are related to lions, ultimately. And the reason we know that different groups of cats are related is because some of them can interbreed with others. Lions and tigers, for example, can uh, mate and have offspring. You know what you get if you cross a, f a male lion and a female tiger? You get a liger. <laughs> These are not uh, made-up mythological animals with magical powers. Uh, it's pretty much my favorite animal, if uh, you get that reference. But uh, it's not just with cats. Let's look at other examples of mammals, um, just, just to take the, ma the case of mammals. If you cross a camel and a llama, you get a comma. Cow and a buffalo makes a beefalo. Uh, zebra and donkey makes a zonkey. Zebra and horse makes a zorse. A goat and a sheep makes a, a jeep. Or I think it's pronounced geep, actually, because a jeep is what you drive. Uh, pig and a boar cross. Here's a, a polar bear mixed with a grizzly bear to make a pizzly bear. And at SeaWorld at one point, they had a, a false killer whale in the same tank as a dolphin. Those two, uh, they were surprised when one of them became pregnant because they bred together, apparently, and they had a baby wolfin calf. Now, in many cases, these animals are sterile, but just the fact that they can breed together and produce offspring indicates that they're the same original created kind. And so that, that shows you that Bible believers do accept lots of variation. You know, all the cats in the world probably came from just a pair of cats aboard Noah's Ark and so on. And so that, that actually means that that helps us to solve the challenge of how did Noah fit all the animals on the ark. It was just two of every kind, not two of every single individual variety and species and subspecies and so on. And so there, there's so much more along these lines that I'd love to share with you, but hopefully what I've discussed tonight, just the tip of the iceberg, it uh, gives you confidence of this, that what we see in God's world agrees with what we read in God's word. You folks get excited about seeing how real science actually helps to support the truth of Genesis? And, and are these things too hard to understand, like talking about fossil teddy bears and ligers and Neanderthals and things like that? Like, um, could you see yourself sharing this with others? Because how many of you have a, a friend, neighbor, or a family member crazy relative that uh, thinks you're nuts for believing the Bible. <laughs> well, um, chances are skeptics don't tend to come to church meetings to hear about the evidence for creation. And how are, how are people going to learn about this information at all? Are, are kids going to learn about a case for creation from their public school system, from the news media, from Hollywood, from Discovery Channel, from National Geographic? People aren't going to hear about this unless Christians equip themselves with this information and then pass it on to their own circle of influences. And so uh, if you came here tonight and you say, boy, that was a good presentation. I agree with that gentleman up there. That's wonderful. But I hope you'll actually take it a bit further than that and think, what can I do in my community to, to influence, especially my own family? How can I help them to see that the Bible is trustworthy? Uh, let's make sure that the people in our own families don't become one of those statistics, right, that we talked about earlier on. And maybe I've just raised more questions in your mind than I've given you answers tonight, but that's why we produce all the resources that we do to answer these other questions that might arise. And so um, if you have questions, I hope you yourself will search uh, for the answers to the, the materials that we bring or other places. Um, and so I hope you don't mind if I just get practical as I wrap up here and mention a few things that you might think about picking up uh, from the book table as you leave tonight. Uh, if you say, boy, you guys publish a lot of materials, where do I even begin? Uh, then let me make a few recommendations. Our most important resource by far is Creation Magazine. We get more salvation testimonies through this uh, resource than any of our books or DVDs, and it's my personal favorite. Um, it's fun to read because it's just got these, you know, uh, glossy full color um, pictures and things to accompany uh, lay-friendly articles. And we, we cover things like dinosaurs and Mount St. Helens and ape men carbon dating and so forth in this magazine. So here's a, an example we had not long ago, this article about two baby girls who are twin sisters. How's that possible since they obviously have very different skin shades, right? Looks like black and white, <laughs> but it's just light skin, dark skin, and they came from the same mom and dad. And genetics can help us to explain how that is possible within a single generation. You can get lots of variety in the offspring. And so that shows how all the variety we have today in people groups worldwide can be traced back to an original pair, Adam and Eve, in the recent past. Um, you might think about after you read, if you get the magazine tonight, give your copy away after you've read it yourself. 
And this 99-year-old said that she uses it for evangelism, right? You might be scared to have a conversation with somebody, but you can let this magazine do the work for you. Uh, so anyway, if you're interested, we're going to just, like we did before in a moment, pass around some sign-up sheets. If you want to get the magazine, you just tear off one of these forms and then fill it out ahead of time before you bring it back to the book table at the end. And that way it helps to prevent long lines. You're not filling out the details while you're standing in line there. And uh, if you'd like to, we have uh, some things as an incentive to take home. If you want to get a one-year subscription, uh, it's four issues per year. We'll give you the first issue tonight, so you can take it home and start reading right away. And also, there's no extra charge. If you want to put down your email address, we'll give you the digital as well for free. And with that, you can actually share it on up to five different devices. And so the goal is that you just get one subscription, and you can actually give this to your kids, grandkids, your family members, your neighbor, whoever else might want to read it, up to five different devices. Uh, but then on top of that, if you want to do the two-year option, we'll give you all that plus a couple of DVDs. One is a documentary on Darwin's life, where we have um, high-quality um, reenactments from history, interviews with believers in evolution, scientific and historical experts, and they make some pretty revealing admissions about ideas that Darwin once had that have been disproved by more recent discoveries. The second DVD would be the one that interviews college students on university campuses, and where they, in their own words, describe why they believe in evolution, why they walked away from church, and so on. So if my volunteers can go ahead and pass out those um, sign-up sheets again um, for Creation Magazine, you can do that now. And I'll mention just a few things then um, besides that. Uh, in the magazine, we, we talk about dinosaurs as well. I, I sort of, um, I raised that question at the beginning. I didn't yet answer it, so let me just touch on one thing here. Is there evidence scientifically that dinosaurs lived more recently than millions of years ago? Uh, yes, on the screen you're seeing soft, stretchy tissue from inside a dinosaur leg bone. How come this did not become fossilized but also did not disintegrate beyond recovery? The laws of physics and chemistry tell us this material ought to be gone if it was in the ground for 65 plus million years, and yet it's still there. And this is not a one-off thing. There are lots of examples of dinosaur soft tissue and other things throughout the fossil record that point to it being dinosaurs having lived much more recently than is commonly believed. Uh, and so we cover that in our books as well as the magazine. Um, the Creation Answers book is a great book to pick up. It deals with 60 of the most asked questions, like there's a chapter on dinosaurs, one on natural selection, one on carbon dating, distant starlight, uh, where did Cain get his wife since he wasn't able, and so on. I'll let that one sink in. Thank you. Uh, great ones for high schoolers. A short read is this um, little booklet that just covers some basic evidence for creation, and what, it, what do you do if, creation is be, if evolution is being taught in your classroom, how to respond in, in, with grace and truth, practical do's and don'ts in that booklet. If you're not a big reader, there's DVDs to browse through. My favorite is this one. Interviews Bible-believing scientists who have PhDs from secular universities, but they believe in Genesis, and they critique evolution from a scientific point of view. Uh, there's some great animations to help make this um, understandable to lay people as well. And so that's just a, a really great DVD. Um, one more is this 12-part uh, series. This could be for somebody who runs a small group or Sunday school class who maybe you're not an expert on creation, but if you want to let um, our scientists and staff, I'm one of the presenters on this 12-part DVD set. They're uh, 40 minutes or less, and there's a study guide that you can just facilitate discussion by asking questions after you play these in a classroom setting. Uh, don't forget, we got a website with lots of freebies as well. Um, I think it's like 13,000 articles or something like that we have online. And there's free video content on the website as well. So I'll leave you with uh, a return to where we began. Here in 1 Peter 3.15, uh, keep in mind, this verse is not just for nerds like yours truly, right? This is for every Christian, isn't it? It says that we should in our hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks us for a reason for the hope that is in us, but do it with gentleness and respect. And so I hope you folks will take up that challenge tonight. Um, equip yourselves with the answers. Um, do the preparation for that test that's coming so that when somebody asks you, how do you know the Bible is true? Why do you believe in Christianity? That you can point to them to the truth that the Bible is accurate right from the very first verse. All right? And I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Keaton.
Keaton, if you want to stay up here real quick. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's have another round of applause uh, for Keaton tonight. So thanks for coming out. If it's okay, we'd like to pray for you. Absolutely. All right. So we want to pray for Keaton and his ministry. So if you would, if you want to sh uh, reach out your hand this way, that'd be great. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just uh, are so thankful for your word and that it is trustworthy. Father, in that we can trust what we read in the Bible to be true and good. Father, we just lift up uh, Keaton tonight and his ministry. Uh, we lift up CMI. God, we just pray that you would continue to give them uh, blessings and favor. And God, that you would give them uh, faith to see the doors that you open and uh, courage to continue to walk through them. We just uh, pray against any attack of the enemy on Keaton or his ministry. Father, we just pray that you'd fill him with your spirit to continue to speak the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we just are so thankful for tonight, and we pray that you are honored and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, Keaton, so much for coming out tonight. Uh, as you leave, like I said, the table is right there in the foyer, and there's more uh, coffee, drinks, and cookies in the kitchen that you can help yourself to. So thank you so much for coming tonight.